Is this on? Yes. Okay. I now reconvene to the regular meeting of the Board of Education at 7.05 with Blair Cruz, Na Orozco, and Fikes present. Before we begin, please silence all electronic devices and note that these proceedings are being recorded. Stephanie. The board met in closed session from 545 to 702 regarding conference with legal counsel existing and anticipated litigation, a student expulsion matter, conference with labor negotiators, ACT and CSEA, and public employee discipline dismissal release. No further action was taken that requires public disclosure. Thank you. I'd like to ask Kelly Larned to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance tonight. And sorry for your last minute notification. Ready, begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. We are now at comments from our student representative, Alexi. Hello and good evening. I would like to thank the board for giving me the opportunity to hear, speak to hear speaker Dan Rather, who gave advice and expressed the importance of the press. Our next superintendent's advisory council meeting is on November 6th, in which we will discuss ways we wish to improve the mental health of the students in the Chino Valley Unified School District. For school updates, Ayala had their homecoming dance on October 8th, followed by a spirit week and a throwback Disney recognition rally in which they recognized band, the fall sports, yearbook, the performing arts student of the month, best attitude, and staff member of the month. Buena Vista High School participated in planning a suicide prevention week. For Chino High School, Chino High School had their groundbreaking ceremony, and I would like to thank those who attended for, for showing your support. I am very excited for the future of my school and cannot wait to see the new campus. We had a suicide prevention week in which clubs came out at lunch to bring awareness. Our homecoming season has ended, which consisted of our homecoming dance, spirit week, and football game, where we crowned our homecoming king and queen. Chino High School also had blood drive presentations and a blood drive. Chino Hills hosted an open forum with representatives from each homeroom class to promote student voice within their campus and will be hosting a second open forum in November to better focus on some of the concerns voiced. They had a homecoming assembly and prepared for their game and dance. They will have an academic rally on November 2nd. Magnolia Junior High School had a Disney themed dance. Assemblies were held about the dangers of social media and kindness, where Houston Craft presented how to distribute kindness around school. At Townsend Junior High School, a student of the month lunch was held rewarding students who have gone above and beyond. They held their first dance, themed 80s and neon, and had a parent night to inform parents on the recent advancements in technology inside classrooms. Woodcrest has been collaborating with the special needs students every Wednesday and hosts activities during lunch. They have also, been plan they have also planned a Red Ribbon Week. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Alexi, I especially want to highlight that you're doing a great job of including all the schools, not just the school that you attend. It's, it's exactly what we envision for our student representatives. So I appreciate your work on that. Thank you. We are now at comments from employee representative Stanny Hernandez, CSEA president. Good evening, President Fikes. Board members, superintendent, infield, cabinet, and community. Um, just real short, I wanted to send a very special thank you to the district. Um, this year, or actually next year, we'll be sending, with the district's approval, five members of our instructional aid group to the Paraeducator Conference, which is in Sacramento, March 6th through 8th of 2019. Um, a lot of our members thought because it was so far away, we normally have it here in Ontario. Um, but talking to Dr. Enfield, uh, the district agreed to send five, and I just wanted to, again to say thank you. Thank you. Yvette Farley, uh, CHAMP president, not here this evening? Yeah. Nothing to say. 
Okay. And Kelly Larned on behalf of ACT. Perfect. We are now at community liaisons. Presenters serving as community liaisons should limit their comments to matters relating to their community agencies. If you would like to comment on agent agenda items or non-agenda items that are of general interest, we would appreciate it if you would complete a speaker card as all other community members do. Art Bennett. Paul Rodriguez. Mike Krieger, I see you in the back. Yeah, tonight, thank you. Thank you. Um, anyone from uh, Supervisor Hagman's office? No? Okay, we are now at comments from the audience on items not on the agenda. Stephanie, are there any requests to speak on non-agenda items? Yes, there is one, Madam President. Speakers will be called, well, in the order the request was received. <laughs> You'll be first. <laughs> <laughs> Please listen uh, for your name and approach the podium. Any comments on agenda items will be accepted during consideration of that item. Once the board has commenced del deliberations on an issue, speaker cards will not be accepted. The board is very interested in your comments, but please bear in mind that the board typically does not respond to comments during this time on the agenda, as it is reserved specifically for public comments. Individual members may respond during board comments at the end. Additionally, the board does its best to support the public's right to address its elected officials. It's also important that the board conduct its business in an orderly and fair fashion as provided in board bylaw 9323. In the event that an unusual amount of speaker cards is submitted for any one item, the board will hear up to 30 minutes of comments. In the case of non-agenda items, the board can, if it chooses, hear the remainder of comments after all business has been conducted. Mrs. Blair, will you please explain the light system? Speakers, you have three minutes in which to make your comments. Please begin your comments at the green light. The yellow light indicates you have 30 seconds in which to complete your comments. The red light indicates your time is over. And before you begin your comments, please adjust the microphone as necessary so that you can be clearly heard. And audience members, please refrain from making comments while speakers are at the podium. Speakers, please remember that in accordance with Board Bylaw 9323 Bylaws of the Board Meeting Conduct, limit remarks to three minutes total for all remarks, and please limit remarks to new points. The Board would like to remind you that Board Policy 1312.1 contains the procedure for anyone who wishes to file a complaint against a district employee. Please follow that procedure. No speaker shall exceed the three-minute limit. Uh, the First speaker and the only speaker on non-agenda items, Mr. Brandon Blanchard. Good evening, Good evening President uh, Bikes, board members, I don't think we have a microphone superintendent on. and staff. M mics on. Thank you very much. Good evening, President Bikes, board members, superintendent, staff, and community. Uh, it's November again. It's time for the Chino Boxing Club to host this annual Chino Boxing Foundation Gobbler Gloves. We'd like to invite all of you, it's as well as our community, out to this event, which will be held on Sunday, November 18th okay, at 1 p.m. And I'll give you more details when I finish at the end. Uh, on behalf of the Chino Youth Boxing Foundation and its board of directors and our president, Yolanda Hogan, again, we'd like to extend that invitation to you. It's an annual event that we have at the Neighborhood Activity Center right behind the city of Chino City Hall, affectionately known as the NAC. The address, 5201 D Street. Our annual event hosts up to 20 competitive bouts, starting from age eight up to age 17. Most of the students that are on the Chino Boxing Foundation uh, Youth Boxing Organization are CVUSD students, so we would love for you to be out there. As well as community, please come out and support these uh, young men and young women. The Chino Boxing Club dates back to about 1960. Uh, it was founded by members of the community, the city council, as well as the police department. It was in hopes of getting youth off of the streets and being able to give them an activity other than other things that they might get interested in. And I'll let you fill in the blank. Uh, <laughs> part of the Boxing Foundation is to make sure that we foster community responsibility, uh, good sportsmanship, honesty, loyalty, courage, and respect for others as well as getting strong physically and emotionally and growing a productive and caring community member. Membership of the club and information can be found on chinoboxingclub.com. 
cityofchino.org. We'd love to have you get in the ring, not necessarily to fight, <laughs> but to pass out a turkey. The participants that day after their match is given a turkey to take home uh, to their family. If you see the smile on these young men and women's face, not from the boxing match, but being able to give mom or dad a turkey uh, is a wonderful thing. Again, the Chino Boxing Club Gobble Gloves, Sunday, November 18th, from 1 p.m. to 6 p.m. The cost is $10, 12 years and older, $5, 6 years to 11 years, Five years and under is free, and plenty of free parking. Chino Neighborhood Activity Center, 5201 D Street. There will be a snack bar available. Thank you for your time, and we hope to see you there for any amount of time that you can be there if you can. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you. We are now at changes and de deletions. Stephanie, are there any changes or deletions? No, Madam President. This needs to go to Stephanie. Are there any agenda items or any agenda? Are those non agenda items? I, there was one just handed to me that was a non agenda item on special education. Okay. Uh, Mr. Peter Atwood? I just uh, came upon another uh, kid um, who has not been assessed in about four years. Uh, they've um, they've pretended that she had no problems. They actually tried to exit her from SPED last year, even though she has all sorts of problems, like one side of her brain doesn't even function Edward, correctly. Can you hold on just a minute? I, I don't know that your microphone is on. Is that microphone on? We can't hear you. Can you talk into it? They're saying you're not speaking directly into it. Okay. Well, any, anyway, I just saw a remarkable case. This kid actually um, has part of her brain just sort of doesn't isn't online. She still functions really well. And this is a kid that they tried to exit from SPED last spring. She, they, she had not been assessed in four years and change, which is totally illegal. And... So we asked for independent evaluation since the district had indicated that it was not interested in assessing the girl. And so they come back and say, oh, we want to assess in all these areas. Uh, no, they don't get to assess in all these areas after they blew it off for years and years because they didn't want to so resolve her problems. Now, the thing that bothers me is how typical this is. It's like I moved, I moved into a place once and every time you'd pick up a matchbook cover or something, a cockroach would run out from under it. So we got the cockroaches under control after a while, but that's the way it is here. Every time I pick up a, a special ed case of any kind, cockroaches run out. And it's been like this for, you know, all the time that I've known. And, you know, we just recently had three suicides in Athaloma and one in Chafee. One of the reasons these happens are because kids are in desperate shape. They're in miserable shape because of their learning disabilities and whatnot. And then all of a sudden, the districts uh, express all kinds of concern when that happens while having spent years doing everything possible not to see and not to do something about the kid's situation. Instead of thoughts and prayers and counseling after the fact, how about actually doing justice to these people? Because, you know, they are the weak among us because they can't, can't speak for themselves very accurately. At least three of you here claim to be Christians, and it's pretty clear what you're supposed to do on behalf of the weak and, and the poor and those who can't speak for themselves. I'm, I'm again suggesting, and not for the first time, why not actually pay some attention to that and do something about it? Make the special ed department actually do their job, which they don't want to do. We are now at consent. Stephanie, are there any speakers on consent items? No, Madam President. Uh, board members, do you have any polls? Uh, Mrs. Orozco? None. Mr. Cruz? None. Mrs. Hernandez-Blair? None. Mr. Na? And I have no polls. And I have none. For the, for the consent items, then may I have a motion? So moved. Second. 
Um, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Preferential? Aye. The motion passes with a vote of 5 0. We are now at information. Stephanie, are there any speakers on information items? Yes, there are. We have 15 speakers on item 3A1. We okay? Yeah. All right. Um, would you, all of the information that I've already read about speakers is still in standing, so would you an announce the first speaker? The first speaker is Peter, Peter O'Brien, followed by Naomi Minogue, followed by Kelly McClister. Good evening, Superintendent Enfield, President Fikes, board members, cabinet and community. My name is Peter O'Brien and I'm a long-term Chino resident and the parent of a Chino Valley Unified School District student. I am here to address the issue of parental consent as it relates to the sex ed curriculum. Calvary Chapel of Chino Hills has told its members that parents are not going to have the option of opting their children out of this program. I find this to be disingenuous for several reasons. First, because it's a lie. Parents absolutely have the option to opt their kids out of the program. It is a provision of the California Healthy Youth Act, which is the law that mandates what is taught to their children. To claim anything else is untrue. However, parents can't opt their kids out of um, sections of the curriculum selectively. The Act and federal anti-discrimination laws prohibit this. Second, Many of the people who have been attending these meetings don't even reside in the district, but have been bussed in in a wave of faux righteous religious fervor. They should concern themselves with their own school districts, just as I concern myself with mine. To do anything else makes a mockery of the concept of local control, and frankly gives one a false impression of the level of support the megachurch actually has. Third, this isn't an issue for, member, for many of Calvary's flock, as they either homeschool their kids or send them to religious school. Fourth, and finally, it's a sadly ironic fact that evangelical families have higher teen pregnancy rates than non-evangelical families. One possible explanation for this is that teens in more religious communities may be less likely to use contraception. It seems to me that this is the very demographic that most needs to be equipped with the knowledge a comprehensive sex education can provide. Unfortunately, there are elements of our board, namely Mr. Cruz and Mr. Na, who want the district to go against state and federal mandates regarding opting out of the curriculum. Regardless of what it might think, our board is not a legislative body and should not be beholden, beholden to vagaries of Calvary Chapel of Chino Hills or the Capital Resource Institute when it comes to determining district policy. We have seen the results of this ill-advised path being followed before. It, already, it has already cost the district many hundreds of thousands of dollars, which will ultimately hurt our kids' education. I would urge the board not to make the same mistake again by allowing our children's education to be sacrificed on the altar of the culture wars. It is much too important to suffer such a fate. Thank you. Thank you. Naomi Minogue. Good evening. I am here to address the board and our community tonight with regards to the proposed model parent rights policy. Our policy is being challenged by a group who travels up and down the state, spreading misinformation and trying to accelerate fear in our community. The underlying reason for this is plain and simple. A group who wants to segregate our transgender student community. Instead of supporting, embracing, and celebrating their courage and bravery, the students are subjected to divisiveness and exclusion. The following is a letter written by a parent of a transgender student in one of our high schools. As the father of a transgender child, I understand and share your concerns. What you want for your child is what I want for my child, namely privacy. In order for you to get what you want, requires, the privacy, requires violating the privacy of my child and other children whose whole goal is to remain anonymous. 
No transgendered child wants to be known as transgendered. In order for you to know this information, these children and individuals would need to be outed against their wishes to do so. Consider that no child or adult who is transgender is required to identify themselves as such to their school principal, school district, or you board members. There is absolutely no legal right you have to know this information. There is no law that requires transgender people to identify themselves to school boards. Your proposition has no legal ground as far as identifying and exposing transgender persons. In order for you to get what you want requires the illegal identification of those who wish to be anonymous. This being the case, I propose a middle ground solution that solves this issue for both the parents of transgendered students and concerned parents. If you are concerned about your child sharing a bathroom or locker with a transgender child, simply have them use the nurse's bathroom or have the school make available a single stall, single use, gender free bathroom such as what you have at home. This solves your concern and my concern about your child's privacy while preserving the anonymity of those who have no legal obligation to identify themselves to you or anyone and guarantees that your child is free from any situations you deem uncomfortable. You know, our district is better than this. Our district should be welcoming to all of our students and our teachers don't segregate their classrooms. They don't segregate their, their students that walk into their doors. They teach and accept everyone, and I'm so proud of the teachers. They're doing their job, which is to educate all the students in our district. Our policy should be to support their actions and to, to support the bravery and the courage of our students and to support their families. Thank you. Kelly McClister, followed by Kristen Hurst, followed by Lisa Perlman Greathouse. speaking tonight to voice opposition to Capital Resource Institute's proposed policy. It is a policy based upon a foundation of lies and fears and it is flawed in so many ways. The first issue we need to clarify is that the district has an active opt-out policy, period. Parents must sign a permission slip allowing their student to participate in the sex ed lessons. It is currently an all or nothing option, not a buffet style line item of topics to opt out of. What the policy is seeking would be impossible to implement. There is no way to determine what questions could arise from students or what discussions may be sparked organically during a lesson. There is no way a teacher can allow participation based on a minute by minute, chapter by chapter opt out. Parents need to continue to either opt in to the sex ed curriculum or opt out altogether. Secondly, there is no way to legally or even practically know if a transgendered person or a person with a particular sexual orientation is using a public restroom. Therefore, if a parent does not want to have their child being in a restroom with such an individual, they may request their student only use the office bathroom or the nurse's office bathroom at school. That way, no privacy laws are being broken. This is being called a parental rights policy, but really it's a replacement for parental responsibility. Each parent needs to view the sex ed curriculum on their own and make the informed decision to totally opt in or opt out of the curriculum. Each parent needs to make arrangements to accommodate their beliefs for their student, not violate the privacy rights of others. Lastly, I want to voice my utter disgust at Mr. Na and Mr. Cruz for sitting silently at the October 29th Capital Resource Institute meeting and allowing Miss England to call the CVUSD teachers liars over and over again. She vilified our district's teachers and you said nothing in their defense. Your passivity and lack of action to stop the lies again proves you are unfit to be in a position of authority on the board and we need to stop the rotational model of electing board president. You lack the ability to follow the school district bylaws. You are again attempting to replace public policy with your own personal preferences, even at the expense of the reputation of our district teachers. Enough is enough. Christy Hurst, followed by Dina Sean, followed by Juan Villalba. Good evening. I am here to address the proposed parental consent policy that is in tonight's agenda. I want to say I have been researching this policy extensively. 
as Capital Resource and Ms. Karen England have been lobbying to bring it to many California districts, and I can find no single other district or school who have adopted this policy. I think that is very telling as Capital Resource spends a lot of time trying to get this policy adopted all over the state of California. There are so many things wrong with this policy. It creates unnecessary work as our district already goes above and beyond regarding parent consent and opting out rights. It is a violation of California State Ed Code and non-discrimination laws, and to top it off, the actual implementation of this at the site level would be a divisive and logistical nightmare, which I can speak to as a former teacher for CVUSD who taught elementary and high school. The proposed policy on tonight's agenda states that family life education means instruction, materials, presentations, or programming that discuss gender, gender identity, gender expression, sexual orientation, discrimination, harassment, bullying, intimidation, relationships, or family. It later goes on to say that a parent or guardian of a pupil has the right to excuse their child from all or part of comprehensive sexual education, HIV prevention education, and family life education. This isn't only against the law, but there's no way to know when these things will come up in the classroom setting as many of these topics arise organically, which coincidentally makes the best teaching moments. Additionally, family comes up every day in most classes. For example, almost every story read in class usually somehow includes family. Are teachers supposed to have alternative assignments daily that do not include any mention of these things? I do not think that's even possible. I would like to close by reminding this board of their goal to attract and retain high quality teachers. As a parent and voter in this district, I cannot express how important this is to me. This week, I attended a meeting ran by Capital Resource and listened to Ms. Karen England tell the audience that their teachers they trust are liars and not to trust what they say. Mr. Cruz and Mr. Na, you were also at this meeting, and you are supporters of this group and their agenda. As a teacher, I would not feel valued or want to work for a board who would support a group like this. You did and said nothing to correct those lies and have put your personal agendas over your obligation to provide families with accurate district information. I hope you will not adopt this policy. Thank you for your time. Dina Sean, followed by Juan Villaba, followed by Frankie. Hello, my name is Dina Marie Sean. I live in Chino Hills. I am a associate clinical psychologist and therapist at a high school not in our district, outside of my home district. I'm also presently a uh, doctoral candidate in the area of public administration and policy. And the issue that I'm speaking about, which I, I just recently learned that this issue was even before the board, um, speaks to two of perhaps the most significant pillars of public administration and policy, that of equity and fairness to all and representation. I'm going to continue by s right now as, as a parent. I am a parent. I have four children. I have been blessed to have my children schooled in the Chino Valley Unified School District. I initially started out because I was raised back east, if you haven't picked that up yet, um, in private parochial schools. So I thought that was the way to go. So I initially started out with my children in a Christian school. I soon learned that that was not where they needed to be, that they were learning anything but Christian principles. So I moved them to Rolling Ridge. That was my home school. And my experience with each and every teacher that my children have had at that school was that they were being taught greater Christian principles than they were in, in, in a public school, not framed as Christianity, but in a public school, Tenants that make people and characters f uh, you know, healthy and positive and, and contributing citizens, far more so than they were in the Christian school that I had had them in. All of my children, my, my la all three, the first three of my children have gone through the health sex education class that seems to be uh, being made an issue of. And I must say, I had the option to opt out. It's an option everyone has, right? I chose to have my children attend those classes because I, we are allowed to review the information. 
Um, and my experience with, again, all of the teachers, that they are extremely professional. And the material, if anyone has suggested um, has anything inappropriate, um, that would be disingenuous at best. Um, as a clinical psychologist, I am part of the district that this gentleman mentioned earlier. And we did, we had four suicides the first week. I am a first responder. I sit on the mental health task force. And I have had to do over 250 lethality screenings because of the disingenuous, disingenuous, ultra. Thank you. Juan Villaba, followed by Frankie, followed by Karen England. Hello, good evening, board members, community. My thoughts, uh, this model policy that capital resource is pushing does not seem to be consistent um, with the new health education law. As I read the proposal, it appears to be asking that we do not follow the education code and in some instances to explicitly disregard law, active versus passive consent. The board passed a resolution recently declaring that the resolutions that they pass must be lawful. And I would encourage the board members to remember that as well. Is there oath when they vote on this? We're already in the middle of, of an expensive lawsuit because some board members have held their personal agendas above the education of our students and above the law. Adopting this policy would open our district to additional lawsuits and would take additional funds out of our schools. If the Capital Resource Agency is concerned about parental rights, they should take their concerns through the proper channels and do not ask Chino Valley to act without regard to new but existing law. I, all I'm asking is board members act as such, as you are board members, you are elected officials on administrative position. It's not politics involved in this. There's no religion involved in this. It's education of our children. Uh, and that's it. There's nothing more. There's nothing else. Anything more important than that. Inclusion of all community members, not just a section of community members. It's all of us. I encourage you, again, follow the law. You're owned by laws, and follow the laws. Have a good night. Frankie, followed by Karen England, followed by Brittany Hall. Good evening, board and superintendent. My name is Frankie and I am a seventh grader. Last time I was here, I spoke about what I learned in family life. I am here again to talk about what I did and did not learn, since some are spreading lies about what is taught in family life. I learned how, about how my body will is changing, like I will go through a growth spurt and my voice will change. I learned about what to expect, like how hair will grow on my armpits and how important deodorant is. I learned the only thing I learned that the only guaranteed way not to get a girl pregnant is an S T D or not to have sex, period. I did not learn about sex positions like anal sex that Andrew Cruz talked about at previous board meeting. That was actually the first time I heard the word anal sex. When Andrew Cruz said it was, when Andrew Cruz said it, I was in the audience. Family life did not teach me how to have sex or encourage me to have anal sex. Do not believe the lies supported by religious groups. If they are so worried about their own children, they can always enroll into private schools. Thank you for your time. Karen England, followed by Brittany Hall, followed by Erica Kelly. Good evening. 
I'm Karen England, um, and I'm not sure who's lying, but I know someone has been lying because when we have requested the information from the school district, we've been given incorrect information, including information that Ms. Orozco has been handing out as she's been canvassing about um, different policies, and I'll, I'll go into that a little further. So as I said at the meeting, and I will say publicly, I don't know who's lying or why they're lying, but I know the curriculum we were given, I know the information we were given about your policies, your opt-in form, doesn't go with what I requested with the Open Records Act and what I was given by the district as to what's really going on here in the school district. I wanna address a couple of things. Capital Resource Institute um, would never put forth a policy that would ask you to violate the law. I'm not sure how many U.S. Supreme Court cases that your legal counsel has been before, but you were presented with a legal memo and letter stating this policy is not in violation of any state or federal law from Alliance Defending Freedom. Now, Alliance Defending Freedom has won nine U.S. Supreme Court cases in the last seven years. Again, I don't know how many your legal counsel that is going to refute this, but you have all been given a legal memo that talks about every single issue that the opposition to parental rights has brought up. Everything from outing the student, no one wants to out a student, but how can a parent know they need to uh, have their child accommodated and their privacy rights accommodated if they don't know there's going to be a problem? No one's saying identify this, the student in this class or that, that school, just what your policy is. It's, hey, just so you know, we are allowing this to go on and you have the right to, to protect your children if you want to. What's wrong with that? What are you afraid of to let parents know what your policy is in a, in a special notice? I have no idea. The, the whole thing with organic conversations, this policy is very specific and doesn't talk at all about organic. It actually, in the definitions, is written very narrowly. It's instruction, instruction to a captive audience that is coming from the teacher. And so everybody that got up here claiming one side is, is fearful is misrepresenting what the policy does. And again, legal memo that I'm happy to hand out to anyone addresses every one of those concerns and why it is legal to do both in California law and federal law. Um, you all have the, the choice. You can go with Planned Parenthood and the ACLU, or you can side with parents, community members, and Alliance Defending Freedom. Teachers are represented by the teachers union. The board is supposed to represent the public and community. Brittany Hall, followed by Erica Kelly, followed by James Reed. Good evening, everybody. My name is Brittany Hall. I was born and raised in Chino. I'm a proud graduate of the Chino Valley Unified School District. We live in a time where compromise has become eroded and polarized emotional outrage has become the status quo. I normally let my vote be my voice, but I speak up when rationality and common sense is needed. And this is why I'm here tonight. Tonight, I have an obligation to speak on, be on my beliefs and to what is happening in our school district. Currently, our school board is broken. We have incompetent individuals who have turned our school district into a circus and a public spectacle. There are members who are not fit for a position of power, let alone to serve as a rotating president on the board. They have shown us all that they can't separate their fiduciary duty from their personal views. If you can't look out for the interest of all the students and families in the district, you, have, you are absolutely unfit to be even sitting up there on that board. In regards to the current parental rights proposal, it is discriminatory in nature. It will impose an undue burden on the school district and is an attempt to regulate general speech. This is not only authoritarian in nature, it, it would infringe on the First Amendment and one's freedom of free speech. If passed, this policy would be illegal as it goes against current board policy to follow state law. This will absolutely bring yet another lawsuit costing hundreds of thousands of dollars to be stolen away from our children's educational fund. Our own attorneys advised against the adoption of this policy. The troops may have been rallied on both sides tonight, but I speak for those who are not here today. I speak for those who do not support the direction this board has taken. I speak on behalf of the larger community of Chino Valley Unified School District who are sick of this nonsense. We do not want members who will bring lawsuits. We do not want our hard-earned tax dollars to be misused. 
and we do not want money being taken away from our children's education. We do, not want any, we do not want to participate with any particular church, pastor, or lobbyist group telling us how to think and how to believe. We don't want school board members to do any of that. We want our school board who will focus on our children's education and how to improve it. We want our tax dollars to be used solely for our children's educational programs. We want board members who will have not lost their moral compass. We want board members who represent all students and families not those who only align with their personal views. Anyone who sits on that board represents, has one job in this district. It is to represent the community as a whole, not just those you agree with. Clearly, this is not being done. We must stop the nonsense and elect true leaders who will bring back the focus of education and respect to our district. Erica Kelly, followed by James Reed, followed by Brett Tackman. Hello, uh, my name is Erica Kelly. I have taught in this district for the previous 10 years and have served as the Christian Club Advisor at my school site for five of those years. I am speaking on behalf of myself as well as another teacher, Susan Burkhand, who could not attend this evening. I am here both as a teacher and a concerned citizen to urge you to do your job as school board members and let the school district follow the California State Education Code regarding the teaching of sex education and upholding protections for transgender students. You, as a school board, are being asked by so-called parental rights groups to break the law. Failure to follow state ed code will very likely result in additional lawsuits against the district. Lawsuits against this board have already cost the district in excess of $300,000. Parents already have the option to preview the sex ed curriculum and opt out. Why must this be revisited time and time again? In recent years, Susan taught the sex ed curriculum for two years, two years to the fifth grade boys. The curriculum was just explaining how a boy's body changes when they hit puberty. In her words, once the class got over the shock of me using the correct anatomical terms, they were fine. They asked very thoughtful questions. They were mostly interested in what made twins. If you are that worried about the curriculum, then opt out. As a teacher, I am directed by state standards that guide the curriculum I teach. I cannot randomly decide to break the law and teach about my religion or my political views or insert my bias into the curriculum. I'm sure that would not be okay with all of you. But this is what the school board will be asking the district to do. It is not okay or acceptable for our school board to direct our district to break the law. According to the California School Board Association, school board members are locally elected public officials entrusted with governing a community's public schools. Board members, please do not allow this divisive issue promoted by Capital Resources Institute to distract you from what your mission really is. Just because someone drafts the memo with a legal heading from an attorney's office and circulates it does not require you to accept it or their distorted words and beliefs. Put your personal agendas aside. Do what is right for the students of CVUSD. All the students of CVUSD. James Reed, followed by Brett Tackman, followed by Stephanie Yates. Good evening, school board. Well, first of all, I'd like to make a statement. I don't know what the fear is. We are asking for a voluntary basis that we are asked to opt out for our children in certain curriculum and certain items. So what is the fear? What is the fear from the teachers? They're not their kids. They're our kids. They're not your kids. They're our kids. We have the right as parents to protect and teach our kids accordingly. People bring up Calvary Chapel as some vices things. Well, I guarantee you, I got a lot of Muslim friends, and they would be as, as against what the state has proposed as anything else. California law does mandate schools provide notification to opt out when schools teach comprehensive sex education, HIV, 
prevention education. Discussion of gender identity and sexual orientation when not included as part of the comprehensive sex education are not subject to the state's mandate. In other words, schools are not mandated by state law to provide notification and opt out. We're asking that simply, that we are notified, we're asked to opt out. What is the fear? What is the fear of these teachers? It's our kids, they're not your kids. <laughs> Nothing in California law prevents schools from voluntarily providing notification, opt out on these sensitive subjects. For example, the same section of the California Education exempts discussion of gender identity and sexual orientation from mandatory no notification and opt out exempts. We have that right, you do not have that right. Someone keeps saying, you guys represent all the students? Well, guess what? There's a lot of us out here that have students and parents that are opposed to mandating some of this education be sought. I've seen the curriculum. It's pornographic. I've seen the book. You know what? I want another three minutes because I'm getting disrupted. And no one disrupted them. You're not getting another three minutes. Okay, then I'll, I guess we have another complaint that I'll file against you, Miss. Okay, so the bottom line is there are kids. And for this even interruption from people that are not the parents of my children or my grandchildren is obscene. We'll do what we need to do. They're worried about lawsuits and stuff. Well, then stop it. Let us be parents, and they could be parents. They could teach what they want. It's our business. It's our children, and I will not relent. Brett Tackman, followed by Stephanie Yates, followed by Peter Atwood. I would like to remind all audience members not to interrupt. Good evening. I'm Brett Tackman. And I think this is a clear example of what has happened to our society when we have removed our first textbook, the Holy Bible, from our education system. <laughs> Sex education should have no place in the American school system. These are topics that should be reserved for parents and parents alone. And I believe that the left has pushed back, or left has pushed us too far and has woken the American, the silent majority. And we will remember who votes in favor of this bill and who doesn't, and we will vote you out accordingly. Thank you. Stephanie Yates, followed by Peter Atwood, followed by Loretta Creelman. Um, so I was here last time, and I do support the parental right um, policy. And I know for a fact that a lot of parents don't know what's going on in the school, what's being taught, because they're not being told, giving full disclosure. And last time, Mrs. Blair said that you're not teaching normal sex, right? Page 53 out of Positive Prevention Plus, it says sexual contact. Mouth to penis, vagina, mouth, penis, vagina, anus, penis. That's anal sex. It also talks about masturbation on page 34. Now, these are our children. They're not your children. And they might be some of their children. But we're not going around telling them what they can teach their children. We're not imposing our morals, our values, and our beliefs on them. And we don't want that to be done to our kids. So um, I'm not sure what all is in the curriculum, because from my, what I'm hearing is that you're not really being fully transparent about it. So I'm just going to play a little bit from this video that's part of Positive Prevention Plus. And I'm wondering if this if parents know about this and if they're okay with it. Welcome to the Positive Prevention Plus Sexual Health Education Independent Study Program. Whew, wowza. 
That was a mouthful. <laughs> but hey, you're really going to enjoy this stuff. Me and my friends are going to lead you through lessons and activities to help you have healthy relationships and to help you avoid things like STIs, that's sexually transmitted infections, yuck, and unplanned pregnancies. But before we get started, let me introduce you to my friends here. And even though I'm a senior, I don't know everything, so they're going to help out too. And there's some really awesome dudes and dudettes, so let's check it out. I'm Dulce, and I just got my driver's license. Yippee! I grew up in Southern California, but I have a lot of family in Mexico. Sometimes I like speaking Spanish with my grandmother, mi abuelita. I'm not dating anyone right now, and I'm open to going out with guys and girls. Why limit your options to just one gender? Hi, hi. I'm Sarah. I just started high school. It goes on. Why limit your options? Is that what we're teaching our children? Why limit their options to one gender? I thought it's about sexual health not promoting promiscuity. And another thing, are you teaching about our children how to give and receive consent? Because legally, they're not allowed to give consent. Thank you. Peter Atwood, followed by Loretta Creelman, followed by Eric Castellanos. Well, good evening again. Um, I have not looked at this in detail, but I can make a couple of <clears throat> general observations, I think. Um, one of them is um, that I've been speaking to this board about one thing and another for 10 years, and the first time I spoke to them was about uh, adopting the, uh, endorsing Proposition 8 against homosexual marriage, which I, I suggest it was a bad idea because it's outside the board's jurisdiction and was going to get into some trouble, whatever you may think of it. Uh, the board did not listen to me in this. Uh, the board ended up having to pay an extra million dollars in change to the state because uh, they antagonized Christine Kehoe, who was a lesb lesbian activist who was in chairman of a committee there and made sure that, uh, that Chino Valley would, would get punished when they made a little slip. So one way or another, these things happen. And then there's the whole thing, which is now uh, on its way to the Supreme Court, unless the Supreme Court denies cert, which they probably will, uh, which is several hundred thousand dollars. And one thing after another, and the question is, why do y'all keep getting into this trouble? Um, <clears throat> expensive trouble. And from a biblical point of view, let me put it this way, since, since we have people that are interested in the Bible here, and I'm one of them. Peter the Apostle said uh, not to any of us suffer as, as overseers of other people's business. Now, as Christians, we don't have any business overseeing the business of this world. Uh, telling, trying to use uh, the state, the power of the state to force people to behave themselves. So when we try to do that, we will suffer as overseers of other people's business. And that is what has happened here. Uh, it's happened to the Christians here who have a name for themselves as bullies and people who are trying to uh, rip people off and drive them, you know, into what they want. And it certainly hasn't done anything to recommend the gospel to anyone. So it's a very self-defeating sort of thing to do. Uh, this is how you can actually preach the gospel without ever seeing FFRF uh, uh, sue you for anything. You can actually pay attention to Matthew 5 through 7. You can actually pay attention to such passages as Matthew 31 uh, through 25 or 31 to 46, which talk about the, those who are in uh, defending those who are weak and helpless uh, and uh, taking care of them instead of finding ways to rip them off. You can avoid being like the people of Sodom by strengthening the weak, which is what the people of Sodom were blamed for not doing. If you do the stuff, people will listen to you and you'll never get sued. If you blow off the word of God and then uh, carry on in the fashion that you have, it doesn't go well. Loretta Creelman, followed by Eric Castellanos, followed by our last speaker, Eugene Smith. Hi, my name is Loretta Creelman. I'm just here to um, state some facts from my personal beliefs. Um, I'm not here to attack any board member. I'm not attacking any other group. I'm here on defense for my grandchildren. I'm a resident of Chino Hills for 33 years, sent my children through public education. 
well adjusted, everything else. What I'm seeing now is a change, not only here in the school district, but in the world, okay? So it's my job as a grandmother bear is now out. I was the bear, mama bear, now I'm grandma bear. I want my children to have the, the same benefits I had raising them. The chance to raise their children as they see fit, and if they want to opt out, that that is an option given by our creator and this government foundation that we have to protect our family. I'm not discriminating. I've been in healthcare for 40 years. I treated everyone the same. My five-year-old grandson on a daily basis says every morning, God bless everyone, everyone, Lord. Never discriminating. I never bring this stuff up. They, they are self-accepting, so don't put, put them in a pressure cooker by saying, we're turning this, this up on you because you have a religious belief. I allow you to have your religious beliefs, whatever you believe, your special groups or whatever, but to my children, we're gonna hold them, hold them fast. They are in the world, and the world is a pressure cooker right now for them, so let them hold on to the beliefs and let their parents opt out where they see fit for themselves. And, and let everybody have their own beliefs, whatever it is. I'm not here to be angry at any group. I'm protecting my children. Grandma Bear's here. Thank you. Eric Castellanos, followed by our last speaker, Eugene Smith. My name is Eric Castellanos. My wife and I have lived in the city of Chino now for uh, 10 years. This is my first time coming to a board meeting, and I didn't prepare any notes. I didn't even anticipate speaking and addressing the board. Uh, but the things that I've heard here tonight and the hostility that I sense and that has been shared is pretty surprising to me. Uh, with the things that have been shared, it surprises me whether I'm at a church service or a board meeting. But I would like to share my opinion as a parent of a seven-year-old who's being homeschooled, by the way. I, I, I want to be transparent. But my wife and I came here considering maybe putting her in the Chino Valley Unified School District. We've read a lot about what's been going on in the Chino Champion, the discussions with these parental consents, and I don't understand why there's so much hostility coming with parents being given the decision to opt out their kids from something that they don't feel that their young ears should be hearing in a classroom. Okay, I grew up in the public school system from K to 12th grade. And I learned how to read, how to write, mathematics, science, social studies, English, all the basic curriculum. And when it came to sex ed, my parents had the choice to opt me out. And it wasn't this hoopla, it wasn't this hostil hostility, it wasn't such um, all of this dramatics that are going on. It was very easy very basic. And now from what I understand of what I'm hearing here today, the district is faced with the decision whether to force parents to send their kids to listen for 30, 45 minutes about these topics that they don't agree with. Now, whether they're Christian, Catholic, Muslim, Hindu, it doesn't matter. If they feel that it's inappropriate, they should have the choice to opt out. Now, let me tell you something else. I've heard a lot of criticism today to, towards James Na and Andrew Cruz. I don't, under, I don't know these people personally, but I heard somebody say that your moral compasses are off. Your moral, moral compasses to me are right on. If you have conviction about what you believe is right, what is wrong with you sticking by that? If other people don't agree with you, well, then they can vote on it. Just like the people that do agree with you, we can vote to keep you in, okay? So the, you being attacked from this podium, I think is completely inappropriate, and I agree, I agree that parents should have the decision to opt their kids out. Our final speaker is Eugene Smith. So this is what happens when you show up for a, to a school board meeting. Um, I, I'm a teacher with the district. I've been here since 2002, but I've been teaching for 28 years. I've taught grades 3 through 8, 
And like the previous speaker, I'm, I'm absolutely shocked at the divisiveness that's going on. It's, it's stunning. And it's kind of like a microcosm of what's going on in our country. Now, I've taught family law, okay? And you're not going to find many teachers out there that volunteer to teach it. But we understand it's a responsibility. Now, and I will tell you that giving people the option to opt out of something, sex education is simply common sense. It is. Some people may disagree with it. It's a very uncomfortable subject for many people. I understand that. But students need to know. They need to understand what this is and what it means. I would tell you from my experience that when I gave sessions on family law and we would go over the information, they were absolutely focused when we had a discussion. And they would send up all kinds of cards on, on all different kinds of information. But they wanted to know because they weren't getting it elsewhere. Or else they're getting it from their friends, and that's the worst place to get it from, right? So I urge you to really think about this. Because unfortunately, a lot of these students are not learning where they should. We give them the option to learn in school. And I urge parents, if, because I've heard a lot of information or a lot of comment about they're not understanding what's going on or what's being taught, come and talk to us. We are an open book. We always have been. We always have the uh, situation of presenting parents with the information first before we teach it. So I'm confused about the fact that there's some conversation about you not understanding what's being taught. It's an open book. And that goes for everything in the curriculum, not just sex, sex education. Thank you very much. Mrs. Pikes? Yes. I, is it possible to ask a quick question of Dr. Enfield? S certainly. Re relating to this topic, the certainly. information topic. We have an opt-out form, period. I, no discussion about that. You can opt out. There's no argument. We're okay with that. I'm a parent. I have a student in this district. If I wanted to, I would opt him out. So that's not a concern. We discussed it at a prior board meeting. We outlined. I had a copy of the opt-out form. So I still don't know why that is being presented out there. Mrs. But what Blair, I do want to ask is that someone referenced an opt-in form. Is there such a thing, Dr. Enfield, in our district? An opt-in form. There's, there's a form that goes home to parents and it asks, do you want your child to participate in the sex ed program or, or not? Out. Yes. Okay. And so if we do not receive that form back, we have not been putting them into that class. Okay, so it's not a separate form. It's one and the same. You yes. either opt in or you opt out. Okay, thank you. Um, Margaret Chidester from the Law Offices of Margaret A. Chidester and Associates will now make a presentation regarding the proposed new board policy, 5020.1 students, model parental rights in child's education. So if the board would like to go down to the seats that are designated in the front, it would be easier for us to see her presentation. Yes. And we all have a handout on that. Mr. Nye, do you want to take your hand out so I can bring it to you? Good evening, President Fikes, members of the board, Dr. Enfield, cabinet, and members of the audience. It's obvious that the folks in the audience have strong feelings um, in many directions tonight. And many of you have spent a great deal of time um, pondering the California Healthy Youth Act, which has been in effect approximately two years. It is adopted state law. 
passed by the legislature, signed by the governor, that imposes specific requirements on all California public school districts. The Capital Resource Institute has offered an alternative policy. That alternative policy incorporates some elements of the California Healthy Youth Act, sometimes referred to as CHIA. It also adds certain portions of a policy that are not provided for in state law. No doubt by the proponents, it was well intended. The issue that I would like to speak briefly with you about tonight is the context because as drafted, the proposed policy does not consider any other element of California law. And there, ladies and gentlemen, lies the problem. The proponents of this policy have come to our local school board and asked the board to adopt this policy. Not everyone will agree with me. If you can get five lawyers in a room, you can likely get five different opinions. But with no disrespect to any of the proponents, it is the legal opinion of my firm that the policy as proposed and as it would be applied would violate state law and would subject the school board and the school district to significant expensive litigation consuming the tax dollars of this community. I want to take you through some rationale as to why this evening briefly. Um, I have read the document that is offered by the proponents of the policy as a legal opinion. Again, it's obviously well intended and quite earnest. I will tell you that it does not consider the statutes set forth in this presentation. Um, it does not consider the case law on this subject. It is written by an individual who is not licensed to practice law in California. Without further ado, And I apologize, the type is small. There is a handout in the back. Again, the policy takes elements of CHIA, which is California Healthy Youth Act, currently state law. It would insert into CHIA some additional requirements not provided by law. Those in particular are two items which I call your attention to. The first is family life education. That term is proposed in the policy. It is not defined by law. The second is the term physical privacy concern proposed in the policy but not contained in the law. Certainly. Thank you very much. I think you them. need to see them Face still. the board. Awesome. And I apologize to those of you that I've turned my back to. So Chaya defines comprehensive sexual health education and HIV prevention education, and not these two additional terms of family life education and not physical privacy concern. The two definitions are not contained in the education code. And note the definition of family life education. This is especially important from an instruction perspective. We believe that this definition would violate state law in that it goes far beyond the so-called opt-out subjects allowed in CHIA. Family life means instruction materials, presentations, or programming that discuss gender, gender identity, gender expression, sexual orientation, discrimination, harassment, 
bullying, intimidation, relationships, or family. That very broad definition is one of the essential problems with the policy as proposed. For example, a sociology class may well define or may well discuss um, issues of gender. Certainly not body parts and their functions, but social relationships. A history class may well discuss the contributions of transgendered Americans or LGBT Americans. And many of you know that it is state law that contributions of Americans of many groups, not simply LGBT or transgender, now must be recognized by the schools and taught by the schools, including contributions of many cultural and racial groups. So that's a requirement of state law. The policy as applied would prevent that. Um, that's family life education. The policy as applied would literally allow, should a, a parent choose, to opt a student out of a history class out of a sociology class, out of a psychology class. And I was reading an opinion written by another lawyer on the subject that observed literally an English class teaching Romeo and Juliet is about relationships, it's about family. A parent could choose to opt out of that if this were the policy of the Chino Valley Unified School District. The other term that is a concern in this policy as proposed is physical privacy concern. It's very broad. It means any circumstances where a child may be in a state of undress in the same room as someone of the opposite biological sex while on school premises or if not on school premises while under the supervision of school personnel. The term includes, but is not limited to the presence of any person on school premises who asserts a gender identity different from the person's biological sex and who is permitted by policy, practice, or law to access restrooms, locker rooms, showers, and overnight accommodations consistent with the person's gender identity. Um, most of you are aware that it has been state law for a number of years that regardless of gender identity, students must be allowed to access the restrooms, the locker rooms, which with they identify, not necessarily that of their biological sex. So that has been state law, and that predated Chaya. Chaya would allow, I'm sorry, the proposed policy, forgive me, would allow a parent or guardian of the pupil the right to excuse the child from all or part of comprehensive sexual education and HIV prevention education. That part is consistent with Chaya. However, the proposed policy continues and family life education through a passive consent opt out. Note the education code specifically does not include the term family life education. That is a term proposed and very broadly drafted by the policy proponents. Education code is very explicit. It says that Chaya does not apply to instruction, materials, presentation, programming that discusses gender, gender identity, gender expression, sexual orientation, discrimination, harassment, bullying, intimidation, relationships, or family where those topics do not discuss reproductive organs and their functions. Now, the legislature has never been particularly good at drafting. That's a long run on sentence, if you will, for the teachers in the audience. But the message to us, ladies and gentlemen, that the legislature was stating is, as if human reproductive organs and their functions 
are not addressed in the context of those topics, then Chaya does not allow opt-out. Okay? And, and again, sociology class, English class, psychology class, history class, quite unlikely that those classes are explicitly going to address human reproductive organs and their functions. They may address history, social relationships, interrelationships, or as speaker said earlier, family, but not in the context of reproductive organs. Therefore, the opt-out right does not extend to those. Giving parents the right to opt out of instruction on discrimination, harassment, bullying, and intimidations undermines protections in board policy and state law. And it really suggests the message that sends is that isn't really essential instruction for students. Many of you spoke tonight very solemnly of the suicides that this community has experienced. And ladies and gentlemen, part of the reason for instruction in harassment and bullying and intimidation is the horrible negative corrosive effect that those activities can have on sensitive individuals. And if children do not have a baseline of instruction, so all children receive har harassment, bullying, intimidation instruction, then our message that we're sending as adults is it's not really important. It's OK to opt out of that. And, and that's a concern, I know, for all parents in the audience, no matter what your beliefs. Some state law for your consideration. Education Code 201 requires California public schools to assume their affirmative obligation to combat racism, sexism, and other forms of bias, and a responsibility to provide equal educational opportunity. And the code also requires districts to affirmatively adopt policies that prohibit discrimination, harassment, intimidation, and bullying on the basis of gender, gender expression, or sexual orientation. So again, we're required to adopt these policies, but if students are allowed to opt out of instruction about that, the message to the children is it's not really important critical instruction. This is the social science issue that we briefly discussed. Instruction in social science shall include, uh, shall means the school district does not have an option, it must provide shall include a study of the role and contributions of lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender Americans to the economic, political, and social development of California and the United States of America, with particular emphasis on portraying the role of these groups in contemporary society. So that's mandatory instruction. It cannot be opted out of, again, because this instruction does not address human reproductive organs and their functions. That's Chaya. Some case law for your consideration. Several years ago, there was a school district that put on a presentation to teach what was then referred to, it was pre-Chaya, as sex education. And an outside group came in and made this presentation and had a name, quite obviously, to call attention to that group. And this was the name of the group, um, Hot, Sexy, and Safer Productions. And so, as you might expect, um, that presentation uh, given by a school district with that outside organization was litigated by objecting families. And in that case, the court said, these seminal Supreme Court cases regarding the fundamental right to direct the education and upbringing of one's children evince the principle that the state cannot prevent parents from choosing a specific educational program 
whether it be religious instruction at a private school or instruction in a foreign language. So the courts do what many speakers said tonight, recognize the rights of parents. But here, importantly, the federal courts have said there are limits. And, and the limit here is they do not, however, give parents a fundamental right to control a public school district's curriculum simply because they have chosen to send their children to public school. So in other words, under Chaya, yes, parents can absolutely opt out for their child of comprehensive sexual health education and HIV prevention education. But beyond that, the courts have said, and the state law says, Parents may not pick and choose which pieces of other instruction they would like to opt their child out of. Um, the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals heard this case when it went up on appeal from the trial court. And again, it recognized many of the Supreme Court cases that some of you are familiar with. And the Ninth Circuit said, Meyer, Pierce, and their progeny evince the principle that the state cannot prevent parents from choosing a specific educational program. But here's the important part. But they do not afford parents a right to compel public schools to follow their own idiosyncratic views as to what information the schools may dispense. Parents have a right to inform their children when and as they wish on the subject of sex. They have no constitutional right, however, to prevent a public school from providing its students with whatever information it wishes to provide, sexual or otherwise, when and as the school determines that it is appropriate to do so. And just a little bit more, and then I promise to leave behind the court cases and get on with the presentation. Um, as the Brown Court said, Meyer and Pierce do not encompass the broad-based right to restrict the flow of information in public schools. Although parents are legitimately concerned with the subject of sexuality, there is no constitutional reason to distinguish that concern from any of the countless moral, religious, or philosophical objections parents might have to other decisions of the school district, whether those objections regard information concerning guns, violence, the military, gay marriage, racial equality, slavery, the dissection of animals, the teaching of scientifically validated theories of origins of life. And, and again, the key message at the end the court said, schools cannot be expected to accommodate the personal, moral, or religious concerns of every parent. Such an obligation would not only contravene the educational mission of the public schools, but would also be impossible to satisfy. So the conclusion here, Allowing a parent or guardian the right to excuse their child from family life education would impermissibly allow parents to opt their child out of a number of classes where reproductive organs and their functions are not part of the curriculum. I apologize. So, the model policy then goes on to offer some notice provisions. And Chaya also offers notice provisions. There's a good deal of similarity. At the beginning of the school year, or for a pupil who enrolls in a school after the beginning of the school year at the time of enrollment, each school shall notify the parent or guardian of each pupil about instruction in comprehensive sexual health education HIV prevention education, and family life education planned for the coming year. The difference between that policy and Shia in this respect is the term family life education. Recall earlier we looked at how broad that definition was and how broadly that could extend 
into classes that have nothing to do with human reproductive organs and their functions. So if this policy were put in place, um, it would be impossible to describe all of the instances in which families, relationships, um, gender identity might be discussed in a class appropriately consistent with California curriculum. <laughs> there we go. Point it that way. It's wonderful to have an expert in the audience. Thank you, Maggie. <laughs> um, education code 51932B does not require a school district to notify parents or guardians about instruction in family life education. Um, specifically, it does not require that parents be notified that there may be discussions about gender identity, sexual orientation, discrimination, harassment, bullying, intimidation, relationships or family when that instruction does not encompass human reproductive organs and their functions. And there is some redundancy, forgive me, so I'm going to skip ahead on some of these. The proposed policy would include information explaining the parents or guardians right to request a copy of this policy. And there's nothing wrong with giving parents a right to have a copy of board policy. In fact, most of you in this room know that the school board has placed its policies and administrative regulations online on its website, so they are all accessible to you. But please note that the education code says that the parent or guardian notification will include information explaining the parents or guardians right to request a copy of this chapter, meaning the chapter in the education code, the actual law. So in that case, the education code is stronger, if you will, than the proposed policy. The concern here is that the allowed exemption for quote unquote physical privacy concern condones, if you will, segregation. It condones saying because there is a student who is gender nonconforming or who is transsexual um, in your physical education class, you need not participate in the portions of that physical education class. That's what the policy would do. So inherently, it allows and it approves discrimination against certain students. We would not allow discrimination against his students of any particular racial background or religious background, but this policy would condone discrimination against transgender or gender nonconforming students. That would place the district in a position subject to litigation and potential liability. The policy provides that at the beginning of the school year for a pupil who enrolls in a school after the beginning of the year at the time of the pupil's enrollment, each school shall notify the parent or guardian about any physical privacy concern for the coming year. When you think about that and try to see how it might be put into effect, we all know that state law doesn't allow the district to discriminate against transgender or gender nonconforming students. So in essence, if this policy were adopted, the district would have to send a notice to every parent every year and say words to the effect that transgender and gender nonconforming students attend our schools. We can't tell you who they are because like your child and every other child, they have a right to privacy under state and federal law. So it's hard to understand how that kind of notice could be helpful or meaningful to a family if this policy were to be adopted.
And this is the education code section that is important for all of us to be aware of. Um, it has been quite controversial. It, however, is state law and it is reflective of how federal law has consistently been interpreted by the Office for Civil Rights. And that is, at the beginning of each school year, I apologize, um, every student may use facilities consistent with their gender identity. And here, all schools would be required to give that notice every year because they must accommodate students' gender identity. The right to privacy of all children is covered by both state and federal law. And as was mentioned earlier in the comments by many speakers, students have a right of privacy and they cannot be compelled to disclose their gender identity or gender orientation. Um, requiring a student to do so involuntarily would violate their right to privacy. The district's present regulation recognizes the right to privacy, and that is a student's transgender or gender nonconforming status is his or her private information and the district shall only disclose the information to others with the student's prior written consent, except when the disclosure is otherwise required by law or when the district has compelling evidence that the disclosure is necessary to pr preserve the student's physical or mental well-being. In any case, the district shall only allow disclosure of a student's personally identifiable information to employees with legitimate educational interest. So again, that right is already protected in district policy. The proposed policy would also extend to lodging accommodations where a student is attending an overnight trip as well as to locker rooms. Again, the policy would condone or in effect approve discrimination on the basis of gender orientation, which is contrary to law. The district's present administrative regulation already recognizes the rights of students to have alternative accommodations. Accessibility to sex segregated facilities, programs and activities when the district maintains sex segregated facilities such as restrooms and locker rooms or offers sex segregated programs and activities such as physical education classes, intramural sports and scholastic athletic programs, students shall be permitted to access facilities and participate in programs and activities consistent with their gender identity. Requiring the district to ensure that there are sufficient facilities to accommodate all children whose parents or guardians have requested physical privacy of lodging accommodations could cause the district to unlawfully segregate students based on gender identity. Students must be permitted to use the facility consistent with their gender identity. And so, thank you ladies and gentlemen for your respectful attention this evening. Um, members of the board, I, I know not everyone agrees with this presentation of law, but I, I would respectfully recommend to those of you in the room this evening that disagree with Chaya, um, the school board does not have the power to change state law. Uh, the California legislature is the body that has the power to do that, and so concerns uh, that have been raised this evening that are not consistent with Chaya should be um, addressed to the legislator. And again, I thank you all for your attention.
Thank you, uh, Mrs. Chidester. Board members, are there any questions for Mrs. Chidester this evening? Mrs. Blair. No, I think that was the first. Oh, Mr. Cruz? No. There are none? All right, thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you for your attention. We are now at the evening's discussion item. Please announce the item. Item 4A1, Board Bylaw 9100, Bylaws of the Board Organization. Recommend the Board of Education discuss Board Bylaw 9100, Bylaws of the Board Organization. Thank you. Board members, we need a motion and a second to put the item on the floor for discussion. So moved. Second. Um, I also rem I will remind you there will be no action taken on this item tonight. However, if a board member would like to propose changes, then please indicate that you would like to have the policy brought forward with revisions and provide the language to the superintendent for staff to prepare the item. Originally, this item was my item. Um, I have been... Um, surprised at some of the, the requirements of the board president. And so as I am preparing to leave, I wanted the board to consider um, the rotation of the presidency. And I understand that for lots of reasons, it was adopted eight years ago, Mrs. Orozco? Uh, no, actually 10 years ago. 10 years ago. But I, there are several things I would like us to consider. and so. First of all, um, returning the presidency to an open voting system could still allow the board, if they wanted, to rotate the presidency. Because of course you'd have that right to do that. Um, so it would be up to the current board members if they wanted to do that. For me, it seems important that the board president wants to be the president and not just rotated by slot. The president should be able to attend the weekly meetings with the superintendent as well as the California School Board's conference and training so that they can be the best possible representative for our district. Um, secondly, an informed and educated board president is less dependent on staff members and more able to lead the meeting independently. It's important for the board to be able to function in its oversight responsibilities to take um, the leadership role as board members and as community representatives. Third, the board president has many events where he or she is representing the board. And it seems important to me, and, and partly because I'm on a board minority often, that the board president represents the majority of the board members in order to be a credible representative. I just think the presidency is too important to be worried about um, feelings. Uh, I don't think we should be worrying about hurting somebody's feelings because they were not promoted to president. Or should we try to make everyone feel included? Um, I don't think the board is a social gathering. It's a meeting of elected officials who have oversight responsibilities for our district. And I think the presidency needs to be granted to the person the whole board thinks is the most capable, not just the next person in line. Are there any other discussions? Mrs. Blair. I agree with you. Um, my experience as a president, you know, during the rotation, I was excited about it at first, but then I was met with such resistance by the majority that almost everything that I did as board president was questioned, uh, criticized, critiqued. And so as I finish my second term with two years left, I would have no interest in being 
uh, board president. So I agree that it is a position that someone should hold um, and hold it with high regard. But when you have a negative experience, you don't want to put yourself in that position again. And so I wouldn't want to be part of the rotation. And because of that, I support this. And I think it should also be someone who is truly committed to all of the students of Chino Valley Unified not just to a certain segment because you have to go out and visit the schools and um, engage with all parents and all community members and not just be so restrictive that you have tunnel vision. So I agree with you that it shouldn't just be an automatic thing. It should be something that the board decides collectively. Thank you, Mr. Na. I believe um, all of us, as someone said, represent whole community, and we have been elected to serve our constituents. Um, we have not been elected to serve certain people in Sacramento or certain people that has wealth or big name, but we are here to serve students, and we are duly elected by the constituents of our community. So therefore, each one of us has an important duty, not just the president, all of us, to be a servant. That who could give out first, of uh, being a decent person, of uh, being a good neighbor, and one who could sacrifice oneself for others, especially for our children. Who could stand up for the unconsciousness or the wrong laws or anything that comes in harm's way. I could not say I would agree with recreational marijuana law that just had passed, because it hurts our kids, it hurts our children. If we just follow, just follow and follow, and in the end, you're worth nothing but just an air. So I believe that each one of us has a value that we represent and we should duly serve that. Thank you. Any other discussion? Mrs. Orozco? Okay, bear with me. So let me give some background on this uh, policy because it occurred because I advocated for it. Um, prior to my being elected to the board, it was just a matter of the board voting for their officers. Um, and prior to my getting elected to the board, there were a lot of political moves, if you will, that were made to prevent a member from becoming president. And it happened more than once. It happened on the night that I was sworn in. So here I am, a new board member, it, completely expecting that another member would become or be nominated clerk. But because there was a division on the board, I was nominated as clerk and a second member was nominated as clerk. So you have 2-2 two -two and who's the deciding vote? The new board member who um, shouldn't be placed in this position. So was it politics that night? Perhaps, I don't know. Um, I felt that no board member should be placed in that position, not on the first night that they're sworn in to play politics. So I advocated for a policy that automatically um, rotates positions, including when new, two new board members are voted in, they're voted in by the n number of votes that they get. I felt that this policy, um, kept the vision on our students rather than all politics being played by the board. I felt that um, we needed something in place that wasn't about the board members, but it was just a process that was transparent. No politics in play. By having this rotation, it, it assures that any member on the board will serve as president, 
whether you're in the majority or minority, whether it's perceived or real, you have the opportunity to assume the role of president. Now, um, let me address a couple of, of comments. Um, wait, let me get back to, to policies. So we have another policy, board policy 9322, and it re it's in regards to placing items on the agenda. That policy has a 30-day provision where once an item is requested, that it has to go on the agenda within 30 days. Why was that provision put in? Again, because politics were being played. Because board members were requesting for an item to be placed on the agenda, and whoever was sitting in that president seat was postponing the item. So it went on and on and on until finally a board member um, made this request to change this policy. So a lot of these things occur because of situations that have occurred within the board. My goal was simply to take the politics out of it. Um, one of the comments was that it should be to um, the rotation should be st to people who want to be president. Well, maybe that should be a provision in the policy at, to add rotation occurs, but if that board member chooses not to be president, to serve as president, then it moves on. So that takes away from the games of only voting him or her, and it allows a person who, if they choose not to serve, then they don't have to serve. So maybe that's a consideration that should be made. Um, when, you be when you first become president, it's a learning process. Actually, when you become a board member, it's a learning process. Then add a president's role to that, it's a learning process. And I hope that I have been supportive of everyone here who has at one time assumed the role of presidency. Um, and, it's, and each time you, I've served as president three times. And each time you serve as president, you learn more. And it was my goal that I, unfortunately I never got to. My goal was to do a president's handbook to remind people this is what you need to do and this is what you need to do. And perhaps I'll do that later after I'm off the board and I have time. <laughs> um, and, you're, and Mrs. Fikes, you are correct in that there are several events where um, you represent the board. However, we as board members represent the board. Whether we're president or not, we represent the board. And so I, I honestly don't think having the title of president, yeah, it, don't get me wrong, they do. People always, oh, the president of the board is here. But we're board members and we represent the board as well. And so whether you represent one person, two persons, all five people on this board should not be the question. It should just be you're representing this board, this district, these kids. That should be the focus. We need to take the focus off of us, off a person, and make it about the process, not about the people. Thank you. Any other discussion? All right, we are now at board member and superintendent comments. Mrs. Orozco. Oh boy, let me look for my comments. Okay, so um, I'm just gonna share some of the events that I attended. I also serve on ROP commission and we recently had, last week, had a groundbreaking for our CTC, which is our career uh, training center. We had a groundbreaking for our logistics building. So we will have a new pathway of logistics. And we're really excited about that. Um, we're gonna be partnering up with UPS. 
I attended the Chino High School groundbreaking, and I'm excited to see that finished product as I am a graduate of Chino High School. Um, I attended the principal for a day, and actually the attendance from the community seemed like it went up this year, and I was really happy to see that. So thank you to everyone, I mean, and everyone else who helped with that, um, that event. Also, I attended the state of the fire district, where the fire district, we have a great community. They were awarded District of Distinction Platinum Level. So we have got a great, great community, great partners, and um, we have a great school district. We really do. One comment that um, I'm not going to elaborate on, but I am going to touch upon. When I am out speaking with people, I reference our current board policy, any paperwork that I have to support what I speak of. I don't make up things. I don't um, elaborate to where it, it's fictional. I only use board policy or documents that I can reference, that I can direct people to. Thank you. Mr. Cruz. Um, I'm a member of the Boxing Association. And just to let you guys know, the turkeys are coming from Hot Singer um, store. I attended the robotic um, competition. This is their second annual event at Don Lugo. And there was 34 schools. So every year it's getting um, larger and larger. A fantastic program, um, a great women team. I, taking awards in the world championship. You know, the question I would like to ask is, but you don't have to reply back, and, it, and that is the question is, is CVSD in compliance with CHIA? And that's something to talk about later. You know, I have sat back idly, never standing up for the unborn, never taking a stand for the innocent, and never standing up against people who would undermine our American culture. You know, it's time for us to work properly, be accountable to each other. It is incumbent upon all of us to ensure our communities and schools are a safe place, which encourages cultivating talents, be it sports or one of the arts, building strong families, and developing children that are healthy, confident, and moral. The California Healthy Youth Act is an ideology which goes beyond pregnancy and di disease prevention. It is a sexual assault, mass as an educational program. It undermines the innocence of our underage children and is nothing more than a distraction in a scholastic environment that's already overwhelmingly distracting. I want to remind parents that we are the first and primary essential teachers of our children, not the state. Unlike in communist countries or other totalitarian regimes, parents are ultimately responsible for each child's education. The history of education in the United States accepts this principle as true. For generations, character development, moral and ethical values have been taught in the home, then reinforced and expanded upon by the school. Public schools were originally directed to strengthen the growth of a whole body, child, mind, and soul. We cannot allow the government to step in and take over the character building of our children simply because a small group of people decided they would use the education system to push their agenda. To push a curriculum that teaches children we have 116 sexual identities is an ideology propagated as an inclusion, insensitive program which actually undermines social cohesion and trust. You know, we see in 60 years, 60 million abortions. And then we see this sex ed, which is started in 2015 and it's being implemented. I wonder how it's gonna be in 60, 70 years. I wanna see if our children have mental illness because of this, of this tragedy. And we see with Planned Parenthood being so much involved in, in, in the clinics and the abortions, Planned Parenthood so much involved in the sex ed, I see the same thing happening. So this, this has to be stopped. Thank you. Mrs. Blair. Um, President Fikes and Dr. Enfield, we haven't had, I think, a full functioning committee for the arts 
all year. And I think it was um, Mrs. Orozco's intent when she was board president to kind of address this issue. But there is a lot of money out there for the arts and we just need the committee to be reestablished and brought back because great things were accomplished when the committee was together and it, it just kind of fell apart but we need to put it out there again. We need the volunteers. We need the committee back. And um, I don't know if we need official resignations from everyone who was part of the committee. They just kind of, what's the new youth term? Ghosted. They, and, um, but we, we need a committee back. And so I don't know if we have to advertise it again, um, uh, put it on an agenda, and seek volunteers, but I, I just can't let go of, of this project that did accomplish some great things in our district, and there is still a lot of money out there that we can seek through grants. And so I don't know what we're supposed to do to get it back, but if the two of you can discuss that, if it needs to be brought back in on agenda item, so that we can begin requesting volunteers. Not a problem. Thank you. And then I, I want to um, just share my thoughts about uh, the great work you're doing, Dr. Enfield. And I know that um, you may have thought that I had resistance to your uh, being at the helm of the school district, but I wasn't. What I wanted was because there were claims in the past um, when the application process for superintendent took place was that the prior leadership had instilled intimidation on many not to apply because you were the one that was going to get that position. And I didn't think that it was fair to you to um, be selected with that cloud over your head, and that is why I had asked that we consider uh, extending the application deadline. But it was never anything about you personally. It was the prior leadership that had apparently instilled intimidation. But I say that because you have a lot of cleanup to do in this district because of what transpired under the prior administration. Retaliation, harassment of various types. Cleanup at high schools and many of our schools that needs to occur, shakeups need to occur at a lot of our schools. There was a lot that was ignored. There was a lot of retaliation that has taken place for years. And sadly, that retaliation started at the top. And I know it wasn't your um, expectation to inherit all of that. And I'm sorry that you are inheriting it. And I hope that we could shift this board so that we can begin to truly, truly respect all of our teachers, all of our staff, because the retaliation that takes place at every level, where we even have custodians that have to move from one site to another because they voice their concerns and then are retaliated against, and so they have to leave. We have safety officers who are out there advocating on behalf of our children and saying, this campus isn't safe, and instead of being their input being well received, they're punished by not receiving overtime or being moved to another campus that they don't want to be at. But there are a lot of things in this district that, that take place. And though there are great things that are happening in our district, there is still a lot of work to be done. And we need to start by respecting all of our staff and the retaliation and the harassment and um, the protection of some at the cost of others needs to stop. And I know that you're beginning that process and I know that you see it and that you have seen it and I, I just wanna thank you for being 
brave and, and courageous to begin addressing that. And so I want to thank you. And um, I want to say that I'm excited about the next two years come November 7th. Thank you. Mr. Nah. Um, yes. Um, I drive an old truck now. It's older than 10 years. Things are falling apart, yes. However, it's a good brand, I believe. I'm looking at 165,000 miles on it. And yes, I do replace water pumps and fan belts and do brakes. But this is what I've noticed. When I have used wrong parts, it will squeak even more. And sometimes even it breaks down. So looking at tonight, and looking at our issue here on hand, sex education. I went through public schools. I had sex education in schools. And I had no problems. Five years ago, there was no problems. But this new act, the California Health and Youth Act, caused all these concerns from everybody on both sides. Guess what it means? There are some things wrong with that. There are, yes, a lawyer had told us to go look at state legislature. But when, but when you look at their records, there are 32 state senators and state assemblymen who had opposed this act. And something's wrong with this. Because before then, everything was peaceful. And that's, that's my take tonight. Um, I said about being a good servant. When you look at books, good servants usually have a great master. He or she serves. But then do things with love and compassion. Just everybody. The servers, you go to a restaurant, they don't look at you different ways because who you are. You're just their number one customer. So as a board member, yes, it's, you are to sit in a hot seat. You get attacked. You get blamed. But you take it because you're a servant. And I'd be right there that who would oppose me or don't want me to be around. But I'm still there to serve you. That is my mission. Sometimes you want to become an actor. Sometimes you want to live your life. But not to be in a drama, but make a movie for you and people that's important around you. And I believe everyone is important. It makes me no difference. I know thousands of people. But they're all, diff they're all different, but they're all equal. And guess what? We live in the best country ever in this planet, United States of America, where I like President Ronald Reagan and I like John Wayne. That's why we moved here in the first place. So I don't see any difference. So thank you for coming to uh, tonight's meeting. And, and giving us your perspective. So, good night. Thank you. Dr. Enfield. I tell people we have the greatest kids in our school district, and, and I want to share with you this. Um, today I was in a, at a school site visiting schools and, and walking classrooms, and I was in a second grade classroom, and the uh, teacher had called on a student, and the student, um, you could tell, had a speech problem, and he worked himself and kept, you know, sharing the information. And you sat there and you listened to him, and, and it was just beautiful to see him to go. And the kids are all listening to him, and the teacher had so much patience for this child. And then when he finished, which took a little bit of time, all the kids said his name like, "Great job, Andrew! Good job!" And you were just sitting there, and you go. That's the stuff that makes it such a wonderful district. And I tell people, this doesn't happen in any other districts. 
And so I just wanted to share that story of uh, the kindness that our kids demonstrate with one another. Thank you. I also attended the groundbreaking at Chino High School. I don't think I was as articulate when I um, chaired it and I opened that event. I wanted to say in the 60s, we made a lot of crazy decisions about schools, you know. Um, there was some laughing about the word uh, cafetorium, but in the 60s, they thought they could take a cafeteria and blend it with an auditorium and that would be sufficient. There was a huge movement to have classrooms without walls. And um, so teachers who lived through that or educators who lived through that, as I did, um, kind of laugh at construction in the 60s. I think the Chino High School is our most beautiful school physically. And so it's hard for me to say, great, we're going to build this state-of-the-art school because I love how that school looks. It's so traditional. However, there are lots of things that need to be changed at that school and at a lot of our schools as they age. So I am excited to um, see the changes at Chino High School, and I'm happy I was able to correct the record. Um, I also was at Principal for a Day, and again, it's very exciting to see the level of community participation in that event, and it gives you an opportunity to look at our schools from a little bit different perspective. And lastly, probably uh, most teachers' least favorite day is Halloween. <laughs> The kids are very excited, very, very excited. And um, it, it takes a tremendous amount of time and effort and patience to put together the programs that we had at our schools yesterday, um, as well as to, as well as to co cope with all the sugar that's ingested by those children. So I thank all of our teachers and principals and parents that made that such a memorable day. I know for my four and a half year old grandson, he could not stop talking about the chicken costume he saw and uh, came home with such a high level of enthusiasm. And of course, that's what we want for our kids is that they're enthusiastic about school and want to go back the next day to see what's happening. So I thank all the employees as well as our community members. And with that, I adjourn the meeting at 9, 9.13. 9 9.13.